tonight on Connecticut's news station. New video sheds light on an officer involved shooting in Bolton. We're taking a closer look at what happened. Plus day two of the Brian North trial. One of the jurors has already been dismissed. We'll have the latest from court. And cracking down on artificial intelligence and deep fakes. We'll hear the message from lawmakers who are calling for stronger protections. Fox 61 Connecticut's news station begins with a weather watch alert. Fox 61 Connecticut's news station begins with a weather watch alert. Good evening and thanks for joining us for the Fox 61 News at 6. I'm Brent Harden. And I'm Sarah Sanchez. We're in that weather watch alert tonight. We saw some rain today, but we're just getting started here. It's set to be a very wet week. You're looking at the radar now. So when's the next round expected? Chief Meteorologist Rachel Frame joining us now to break down the timing for us. Rachel. Yeah, we've got one round of showers pushing through right now. That will end. And then we have a heavier round of rain coming through right around this time tomorrow night. And if you add Add it all up. We're anticipating an additional one to three inches of rain, and there could be some higher amounts up to four inches in eastern Connecticut. I think we'll see a dry start to the day tomorrow, but then in the afternoon we'll see showers redeveloping, but the heaviest coming down late in the day or tomorrow night, and that will wrap up into around daybreak on Thursday. So their concern is with the ground already super saturated that there could be poor drainage issues, there could be some basement flooding and we'll have to watch the rivers and streams in our state as well. So a flood watch has been posted by the National Weather Service, obviously in agreement that that's something that we'll need to watch as we head through later tomorrow. Here's a look at the showers that are passing through right now. I would say they're winding down as we're gearing towards the news at 10 and 11 tonight. And again, we'll have that break in the action to start the day tomorrow before round number two comes in for tomorrow. Taking a look at tonight, we're looking at temperatures falling back into the 40s, areas of patchy fog, some mist, some drizzle just to start off the day. Look how warm it is in the afternoon with highs climbing into the mid to upper 50s, a rising chance for showers in the afternoon with the heaviest coming down heading into tomorrow evening and overnight. We'll talk about when round number three moves through this weekend. Lots of rain in the forecast coming up. That's what it sounds like, Rachel. Thank you. Well, new tonight, we know uh, more now about what led up to a shooting by state police troopers in Bolton. The Office of the Inspector General has released its preliminary report. Fox 61's Matt Karen joins us in studio to break down the newly released body cam video. Matt. Well, we now know that the reason state police were called to a home in Bolton last Friday was because a young man living there was experiencing a mental health episode. Yet no one trained to handle a mental health crisis was on scene. Friday, March 1st, dozens of state police vehicles descended on the rural town of Bolton for an officer involved shooting at a residence on Meadow Road. Max Maxwell, oh, relax Maxwell, come on buddy. Come on Maxwell, drop the gun. But Maxim Nowak, the 29 year old you see in the video, didn't have a gun, he had a knife, two of them. Maxwell, please buddy, drop it, you know me. You Maxwell, know. please drop it, you know me buddy. I know one of you. According to the Office of the Inspector General's preliminary report, Maxim Nowak, who lives in the home with his mother and father, was threatening to harm himself and others. Three state police troopers were dispatched, encountering Nowak in the main hallway. On the body cam, you can hear Trooper Doug Bernier say that he's using a less than lethal weapon, a taser. I got less lethal. Okay. Less taser. I got Come on, buddy. As the troopers make repeated attempts to get Nowak to put down the knife, Nowak yells back at them to put down the taser. Listen, let's go. Taser. You Come on. put the knife down, and I will put my taser down. Okay. Okay. That's when Nowak begins twirling a knife. A second later. A total of seven gunshots are fired as Nowak collapses on the floor. The report stating Bernier deployed his taser and Contenta discharged his firearm. Nowak remains in the hospital. The investigation into the shooting is ongoing. There has been a push in recent years to get mental health professionals to accompany law enforcement to certain calls. In 2017, in fact, a pilot program using grant money was put in place at Troop E in Montville, embedded a licensed social worker from the State Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to work alongside the state police. There have so far been three police involved use of force incidents this year. In the studio, Matt Karen, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. Thank you, Matt.
Enfield police have made an arrest in connection to a deadly hit and run. Police say Judith Kostak of Enfield hit a man riding a mini bike at the intersection of Hazard Avenue and Water Street last night. The victim's identity hasn't been released. But the crash is still under investigation. Dozens of CCSU students are back in their dorms tonight after they were forced out due to a fire. It happened last night on the ground floor of the Don James Residence Hall on the New Britain campus. We're told everyone got out safely. Students were put up in a hotel overnight until the building was deemed safe. No word on what caused the fire right now, but we are told officials are centering their investigation on faulty electric equipment. The school is offering support services for any student that needs assistance. We're on day two of the trial for Trooper Brian North in Milford. Tonight, we're learning more about what happened before 19-year-old Mubarak Suleiman was killed by police in West Haven in January of 2020. Fox 61's Julie LeBlanc has the latest. He aggressively and loudly said to you, drive, drive, drive. Is that, am I correct in that? Yes. Daniel Green was the Lyft driver for 19-year-old Mubarak Suleiman on January 15, 2020. Green says at first he picked him up at an AT&T store on Main Ave in Norwalk. Soon they'd make their way to a nearby gas station. At that time, were you legally carrying a firearm? Yes, I am. Yes, I this is your, your firearm? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, uh, so what did you do when you got out of the vehicle? When I got out of the vehicle, I, I pulled my pistol and I tell him to get in my car. Green says he pulled over after Suleiman demanded to see his phone and hit him on the back of his head. Prosecutors showing the incident on surveillance video with the defense pointing this out. You got out of your car and you pulled your gun because you were scared, correct? Yes, I was. Um, you were scared for your life? 100%. Green says at this point, Suleiman got into the driver's seat and stole his car, heading south towards I-95. Officers followed him for a bit before calling the pursuit off. We pursued it down the Route 7 connector until we were told to stop. Norwalk officers called it off, assessing the risk to the public as greater than the need to stop Suleiman, a commanding officer testifying to the policy in court. Infractions, property crimes, including stolen motor vehicles and nonviolent misdemeanors and felonies are not cause to engage in pursuit absent articulable exigent circumstance. Shortly after, though, state troopers picked the chase back up near Milford with information from dispatchers that it was a potential carjacking with the suspect armed with a knife. Eventually, Suleiman crashed into another car on Campbell Ave in West Haven. That's when court papers say Trooper Brian North approached, thinking Suleiman was grabbing his knife and fired his weapon seven times with three bullets hitting Suleiman. State Police Sergeant Kevin Duggan going through the evidence found on scene showing the jury. These are all expended shell casings from a firearm. With the Suleiman family sitting in the courtroom. So this is the magazine that's associated with the firearm. Also happening today, the judge released one of the main jurors after he says he noticed they were having a hard time following along. Now, that comment from the judge came after a similar one yesterday where he told the attorneys that same juror seemed sleepy during the testimony. Now, the main juror was replaced by one of the alternates. We are in Milford, Julia LeBlanc, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. State lawmakers are trying to regulate artificial intelligence. A new bill moving through the Connecticut General Assembly this session would institute protections and safety measures and train workforce on the changing technology. Fox 61 political reporter Emma Wolfhorse spoke with legislators and policy experts about this proposal. Emma, it seems like this bill has bipartisan support. Yes, Sarah, Brent, Democrats and Republicans agree about the importance of protecting residents from the harms of AI, specifically deep fakes. That's when video, audio, or an image of a person is used to create a digital clone, making them appear to say or do something they didn't in real life. While lawmakers recognize the need for regulation, they also want to strike a balance and still encourage innovation. It is supremely important that the legislature protects people from the potentially dangerous uses of AI, namely deep fakes. Connecticut lawmakers are raising concerns about artificial intelligence. This technology can be used to make it look like someone is saying things they never said, just like right now. 
I never actually said any of this. Wong's staff used clips of his voice to generate this deep fake to show just how easy it is to clone someone's likeness. I felt a tremendous sense of a privacy lost, identity theft, and misrepresentation. Wong wants to institute stronger protections against deep fakes at the state level, and so do many other lawmakers. Technology moves faster than the legislature does, but what we're working to do and working to do responsibly is just putting those parameters around this technology so that it's used in a way that gives people confidence that what they're seeing, what they're hearing is legitimate. The legislature is considering a comprehensive AI bill, which would institute regulations for this technology, like prohibiting distribution of synthetic images and deceptive media concerning elections, establishing an artificial intelligence advisory council, and incorporating artificial intelligence training into workforce programs. Nobody's looking to put the genie back in the bottle, and nobody's trying to say that we can't use AI. Uh, but Connecticut really is the leader. Some in the industry, though, wanting to ensure companies are still able to innovate. We want to ensure that that innovation happens and the benefits of those innovations spread uh, across society equitably. Bill has nearly 30 co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle. Senators Wong and Duff telling me they're confident this measure will move through with constructive criticism and eventually broad support. And that second to last line in my story there, that last bit of track before the final soundbite was actually an AI generation of my voice. Really hard to tell the difference there. Sarah, Brent. It really is, Emma. We were talking earlier. We can't tell. Scary, really. Uh, all right, new at six, a Connecticut company is quickly becoming the center of the nationwide reproductive health debate after the Alabama State Supreme Court decision on embryos. Trumbull-based IVF company Cooper Surgical faces several lawsuits from different states now for destroying embryos. In Alabama's Supreme Court ruling, those embryos are legally considered children. Cooper Surgical is taking their fight straight to Capitol Hill. They have registered to lobby federal lawmakers for the first time over fertility care.